Hello, and welcome to Leader Folk, an inclusive look inside the Jewish community. I'm your host, Sarah Bogomolny, and this week I'm so pleased to be sitting down virtually with Rabbi Julia Appel. Rabbi Julia is a non-denominational community rabbi known for creating open, welcoming Jewish spaces for exploration and empowerment. Rabbi Julia is passionate about creating Jewish community that meets the challenges of the 21st century, in which Jewish identity is a choice and not an obligation. She is the founding rabbi of Bina Community Circles, a new spiritual project fostering Jewish personal flourishing and communal change through deep relationship-building circles, and is also an adjunct faculty member with CLAL, teaching its online leadership through innovation course for rabbinical students across denominational lines. Rabbi Julia, welcome to Leaderfolk. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. I'm so pleased to have you with us and would love if we could start by a little introduction to you, um, your relationship to Judaism and the path that led you to becoming the rabbi and community leader that you are. Well, I always explain to people that I am a liberal, traditional, progressive, feminist, neo-Hasid. So that's kind of me, you know, in a nutshell. Um, I I grew up in the reform movement in a family that was like pretty Jewishly engaged. I went to Hebrew school until 12th grade. Um, We had Shabbat dinners many Friday nights and went to synagogue more than just a couple times a year, I would say. Um, my family's Jewish identity was much more connected to our family story of arriving in America and um, you know, supporting justice issues and connecting with our sort of ethnic heritage in that way, but also, I would say, connected religiously. Um, and then I went to college and I spent my first year working on economic justice issues on campus ended up participating in a three-week-long sit-in for workers on campus. And that, for me, was a really powerful experience, both politically but also Jewishly, that I ended up realizing a whole bunch of people working on this were Jewish. And one of the um, impactful moments of that experience was the first Friday night of that sit-in, Um, a bunch of students from my campus Hillel came over and had a Friday night service at the sit-in. I was on the outside team of the activist group. So I was creating rallies and I was actually doing a lot of the graphic design. I was creating posters and things. And so that was a snapshot in that time for me of realizing, whoa, Judaism isn't just something I learn about, you know, on Mondays and Thursdays and Sundays or whatever. It's it's not just going through the holidays. It's actually a way to live your life. It's something that made these people come and pray at a protest. Um, and, you know, a week later, the protest was still going on. A friend of mine who was inside the sit-in, his parents flew in from Wisconsin to see him, knowing they wouldn't actually be able to visit with him because he was inside the building. If you come out of the building, you know, you don't get to go back in. It's not like a voluntary clock in, clock out kind of protest. And they came just to give him a Shabbat blessing. So my friend, you know, hanging out the window of this building and his parents came over um, and gave him the parental blessing for Friday night. Um, And I saw that and I just, something was alive in Judaism for me in a way that it hadn't been before. So that started me on a path of Jewish learning and really um, also realizing how much I didn't know. I felt really embarrassed. I felt really dumb. I felt like, you know, every question I had was so basic, Um, even though I had had, you know, I went to Hebrew school, but I didn't know a lot about traditional Judaism. I didn't know a lot about Shabbat or keeping kosher or traditional prayer. And so that piece also around um, feeling like it was really hard to access Jewish knowledge. Um, Not that it was objectively difficult, but it was hard to actually overcome my own feelings of stupidity. Um, And, you know, a friend of mine coined a term jubarrassment, which is when you're embarrassed by all the Jewish things you don't know. So both of those pieces really... um, became deep elements for me, the piece around seeing the ways that Jewish wisdom and practice can really be 
guiding ideas for how to live my life. It could actually say something about what I should be doing with my days, um, as well as the memory and the deep impression of, of what it feels like to not know in Jewish settings. So eventually I graduated from college. I moved to DC. I was working in politics and I just found that I was spending all of my free time doing Jewish stuff. Um, by the time I graduated, I was leading services at my Hillel. I was, um, you know, teaching. I taught classes sometimes on Jewish music, which I had gotten very into um, and, you know, was vice president of my Hillel. Like I was very involved in Jewish community and I moved to D.C. And, and yeah, I was spending all my time doing that. And I thought, well, maybe that's actually what I'm supposed to do and not political communications and press releases. So I quit my job. I moved to Jerusalem. I spent the year in Ulpan learning Hebrew like five hours a day, hanging out with rabbinical students, finding my way, you know, experiencing lots of different ways of connecting with God, connecting with community. And then I started rabbinical school um, back in Boston at Hebrew College, um, which just for people who might not know, is a non-denominational rabbinical school um, in Newton, Massachusetts, where I also grew up. And so it was an easier choice. I, you know, both philosophically, I had drawn so much wisdom and so much um, learning from all different movements and kinds of communities, but also it happened to be all of my personal belongings were in my grandmother's basement in Newton, Massachusetts. So like it was an easy move. Um, but yeah, Hebrew College was a really powerful experience for me. I can't say enough good things about it. Um, and then, yeah, and that's how I ended up choosing to become a rabbi. And I feel like those elements around, you know, both my background in activism and I did my undergrad in social theory and, you know, how do societies work? How do people interact with culture and um, really have defined my rabbinate in a lot of ways that I'm always asking whose voice isn't being heard here? Where is power located and how can that be equitably rebalanced? Um, very influenced by the Havara movement. Um, I went to the National Havara Institute for 10 years and some beloved, you know, community for me. So what is each person actually able to contribute that everyone is able to contribute. Everyone is an expert in their own life and their own experiences. So I have a real grassroots sort of bent to the rabbinic work that I do. Um, and also very much awareness around LGBTQ issues, race, ethnicity, gender, socioeconomic status, all of those different pieces, which, you know, were part both of my early upbringing, you know, how, how to make the world a better place. Um, but also then my political work, my academic work and, you know, my own experiences. So that's a little bit about my story and how I ended up um, doing what I do today. When you were in rabbinical school, did you find that that was a place that was welcoming of these conversations towards innovation and inclusion that you're having? Did you find that amongst the people who were teaching you or amongst your fellow students? Absolutely. I, I was so lucky to be able to um, go to Hebrew College for rabbinical school because Hebrew College rabbinical school in and of itself is was a startup. In other words, it was founded by Rabbi Art Green um, and um, and a number of his colleagues in order to kind of be the rabbinical school they wish that they could have gone to. Um, so I was the fourth graduating class of Hebrew College. So I actually went to rabbinical school in a startup <laughs> in, a, in a lot of ways. Um, and so the whole project was um, one that was adapting and um, iterating. And I was part of that process. So um, in addition, I think a central value of Hebrew College as a rabbinical school is around what does Judaism have to tell us for this moment? So it's very much grounded in getting your traditional learning down. So being able to work, you know, in the traditional texts and to really have a thorough understanding of traditional prayer service, things like that, but also um, to have at your disposal um, the ability to be creative and innovative with, with what's in the tradition. So I would say that was really a mode of the school. Um, so I felt like I was, I was in good hands and had a lot of inspiration from my teachers uh, as well as from my peers. But I would say it was, you know, it was later on that I really dug into how exactly do you make communal change or organizational change? Um, I had had the experience of 
you know, being inducted into community organizing. So I had those skills and then later on learned, okay, like how do we translate that to organizational change? And how do you, how has that (laughs) informed the work as you've left school and gone into your teaching and your community building work? So in my, my first two jobs were in synagogues um, in Montreal. And for each of those, I was tasked with creating a new project. In the first synagogue, um, I was tasked with creating a young adults program. In the second synagogue, I you know, re- revamped our family education program. And I was using my community organizing skills of meeting one-on-one with individuals who would be affected by this program, who would be interested in it, trying to understand their lives and what what would make them want to participate in something. So I had those initial skills, um, but it was only in the last four years that I've really had a crash course in innovative methodologies. So um, I'm I'm just finishing up my work at Hillel at the University of Toronto, and we had the amazing opportunity um, when I first started four years ago to be part of a group of Hillels using design thinking methodology to change ourselves into something much more user-centered, much more diverse, much more um, nimble, and um, and really much more able to get to the heart of what students are experiencing. So over the course of two years, I learned how to use design thinking methodology and sort of innovation practices to to do that. So it was a whole new set of vocabulary from the business world um, that I was now applying and kind of upgrading my community organizing background, which you can hear there are resonances, right? In design thinking, you start by interviewing your potential users and really getting to know who they are. You don't just kind of dive in. You know, I, I always explain it like if you're trying to create a new iPhone, you don't just hole up in an office and just make a design and then put it into production and spend millions and billions of dollars doing that. You do like a very thorough, um, you know, interview process of the, your users. What do they use it for? What don't they use it for? Right. And the same thing should be true of community organizations. We should be basing everything we do on our actual users and not just putting our heads together in an office with three people, especially, for example, if we're creating for demographics we're not part of. Um, I think that is true often of young adult programming at synagogues, for example, the people who are putting their heads together. What what would young adults want are usually not young adults. <laughs> They're usually people who are much older than that. And so it doesn't quite work because they can't anticipate what would be important or meaningful to that demographic. So that's where design thinking comes in, where you say, we're going to not only talk to our potential users, we're going to understand not, we're not just going to say, would you come to something at seven o'clock or at eight o'clock? We're going to say, what's your life like? What do you care about? What keeps you up at night? What brings you joy? What does Judaism have to do with your life? Um, because only then can we actually see the bigger picture of who they are and start designing for them. As you've gone through this work, what's been some of the biggest surprises that have come out of asking those questions? I think seeing conventional wisdom just fall. So, for example, um, you know, in the work that we were doing at Hillel, we had received wisdom from past staff members. Oh, for example, oh, um, the students at the university are so studious. They're always in the library and, you know, it's just hard to get them to come to stuff. And it turned out through interviewing over 50 students that wasn't why they were in the library. They were in the library because they had nowhere else to go. There wasn't a student center. Um, They were lonely. They wanted a place to be sort of around people, but also be able to work. And so that was such an insight when we realized that conventional wisdom that was passed on to us wasn't true at all. And Mm -hmm. then the, the result of that is, we completely redid our space to make it have study spaces and snacks and, you know, coffee and places where you can study and be near each other and also be cared for and know that people are going to 
you know, a place it's like cheers, you know, a place where everybody knows your name. Um, but that it was the, the real desire was to have a place to be that wasn't just alone in your room. It wasn't that they didn't like socializing. It was that the library was the only place they could go. So I think that the process of actually talking to your users and your potential users, um, not only does it check your assumptions as the person who's kind of um, proposing to create something, but sometimes it completely topples what you thought was true before. I'd love to hear more about your work with the Bina Community Circle Project that you are founding right now, and maybe a little bit about what you've received from the communities that it'll serve about why it's exciting and necessary and important. Awesome. So I have worked, as I said, in congregations. I've worked in Hillel's. Um, and also myself, you know, I'm a Jewish person who seeks community. Um, I, because I've not been working congregationally the last five years, I've also been part of a variety of synagogues, um, and have in my day, you know, founded Chavarot. And so I'm very involved in lots of different forms of Jewish life. It happens to be that for me, I actually love prayer. I love prayer services. Well, some prayer services. Um, I I love spiritually elevated, inspirational, you know, musical prayer services. And you don't always get that. But I, I actually really love being part of synagogue communities. But as I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, that was a hard fight. I I didn't know the prayers. I didn't know the songs. I didn't know what was going on. Um, so it wasn't always true that prayer services were a home for me. For a while, they were a really difficult, embarrassing place for me. Um, so I'm a prayerful person, but I looked around and said, okay, especially working at a Hillel, right, where we don't have any services. Um, and that's a little different. Uh, so I'm in Toronto and um a lot of our students are commuter students. That's so very common in Canada to live at home. So it's a little different from a lot of the Hillels in, in the U.S. Um, but we don't have any services and we do have a robust community. And so coming from the Hillel world, um, you know, that is such a deep insight, I think, into Jewish life, which is services don't have to be the only door in. With synagogues, um, it's usually, you know, how do I join the synagogue? Well, it's not just I sign up for membership and I pay my dues. It's how do I actually become part of this community? Well, I got to show up a lot of times at nine o'clock on Saturdays and like hope someone talks to me at Kiddush or like, you know, and, and not everybody wants to do that. Not everybody has a connection to prayer services. Um, not everybody likes prayer services or feels like they are something they want to do. But if that's the only door that's open, to be part of Jewish community, then just a lot of people aren't going to be. Um, they're going to find other things. So knowing that to be true, and also, you know, a lot of our friends, we have, we're friends with, I, I have two young kids. Um, I'm married. A lot of our friends, married kids, you know, ha have young families. And a lot of them do not go to synagogue, but have a strong sense of Jewish identity. So I started asking my friends, people I meet, people who came to classes I would give in the community, um, you know, what's what's your life like? What's your Jewish life like? Where are you coming from? And um, the thing is, lots of people who don't go to Shabbat services care a lot about Judaism in their life, care a lot about being a good person, making the world a better place, uh, having Jewish content, passing it on to their kids. It's just that particular door is not the one they want to go through. And in Toronto especially, there really aren't other ways <laughs> to deeply connect with Jewish people. Um, you know, there are clubs, there's film festivals, there's community centers and things. But I think the, what lots of people get out of synagogue communities is a sense of belonging a sense of being embraced, a sense of being supported, let's say an illness or after the birth of a baby or, you know, God forbid, after a death, a caring community of people who wants to actually engage with each other in a very deep way. And it just seemed like that desire for those deep connections doesn't 
it doesn't correlate directly to who wants to show up on Saturday mornings for X number of hours. There are lots of people out there, lots of Jewish people out there who want to have deep and important relationships with each other around Judaism, um, but not necessarily around prayer services. So that's why I created Bina Community Circles, just founding it and launching it this month. It's really exciting coming out of, you know, a number of years of these kind of conversations um, and feeling like I want to create more of those doors. The image I like to use is, um, you know, if any of of your listeners have ever gone to a synagogue you haven't been to before, like for a cousin's bar mitzvah, or, you know, you're checking out a new one and you go right up to the front door and you try to open it and it's locked. Um, and then you kind of go around. I mean, this happens to me every time, you know, I go around to each new door and I try to open it and it's locked. And like, maybe if I'm lucky, there's a sign that says like, go in the winter street entrance and like, where's winter street. And just, you know, the, the, the feeling of going around to all these doors and they're just locked. And so with being a community circles, like the idea is to unlock more doors, um, to have people be able to connect in that deep relational way with support and growth and flourishing and learning. Um, but not necessarily be coming through the door of prayer services. So I understand that right now it probably can't be face to face. And in fact, I think that your first circle, which I'd love you to talk about, is is a virtual circle. Mm -hmm. Is your vision for the future that they will be in person as well? Yeah. So the the vision really is in person, Toronto based. Um, however, with the last couple of months being as they are, I've lost track of the days of the week, let alone the number of weeks at this point. Um, but with with the world being as it is, um, I was going to be launching an in-person class at the downtown Toronto JCC, um, which I call Jewish Foundations. It's an eight-week class, um, which is really like a crash course in Jewish living. And I had taught iterations of it through Hillel. I had taught it, you know, in conversion classes, in synagogues I'd served in. Um, but this intensive, packed eight-week, just, just foundational course in the stuff you need to know to go to a Shabbat dinner, to go to a Passover Seder, you know, where does, what are all the texts in Judaism and how do they connect to each other? All these different pieces so that people could really get started. Um, and you know, it's for people who are Jewish, but never had the chance to learn about Judaism. Um, oftentimes those are folks who have only one Jewish parent, um, or people who aren't Jewish at all, but are maybe interested in Judaism, potentially in converting, or just want to know more about it. And also for people who aren't Jewish, who love Jews, right? The people who are married to Jews, who are getting married to Jews, who have a, you know, a brother, a sister who's, you know, all these different pieces um, who might want to really get a foundational, quick and dirty course in what you need to know to get started in Judaism. And it's supposed to be in person, um, but we decided to launch it online instead um, to see what would happen. We had a threshold, obviously, of enrollment in order to make it financially possible. Um, and I want to thank the National Center to Encourage Judaism for a grant that they um, gave us to support it. And the Miles and Adele JCC um, was hosting the class. And so we created it online. And I totally assumed it was just going to be people in Toronto. But it turns out when you create something online and you do just a little bit of advertising, you end up with someone from Nova Scotia, someone from Richmond, Virginia, someone from Fort Lauderdale. Um, so it opened my eyes just in the last two weeks of this class, the potential um, that there's accessibility um, obstacles that are solved by actually going online. Um, you know, one thing I noticed about the group, we have now a lot of people with very young kids. It's actually really hard to get out of the house, you know, by yourself um, to go somewhere and learn something. And, you know, having a class online means that uh, they could have just put their kid to bed five minutes ago and still be in the class or even the kids still wandering around. But you're in the class and you're in your living room. Um I also noticed that, um, and over over the years of teaching various ways of doing this class, it's also a very welcoming space for LGBTQ folks because 
um, you know, as your listeners probably know, it, there's always a bit of calculus to be done of, you know, when I'm going to show up at a Jewish community, if I'm, if I'm queer identified, like, am I going to be safe here? Are people going to use my right pronouns? Are people going to understand my family structure? Um, and you don't have to do that when it's online. You're actually in your living room. Um, you're actually in your own home. And, but not only that, like that's an explicit component of what I'm offering. So it's not just like an introduction to Judaism class. I'm bringing, you know, an embracing of everyone's identity pieces. So whether it's race, ethnicity, um, you know, gender identity, all of those different pieces, um, that that's another essential component of this class that I'm offering. And so for that's that also connects to geographic accessibility. So when it's online, now people who are living in places where there isn't a robust Jewish community can still get their Jewish learning. Um, so there are a number of different ways that going online, it turns out, increases accessibility in a way that I, I didn't necessarily really expect, although it seems obvious now. I love this so much as an example of the innovation that we're seeing across the Jewish community right now in the midst of this pandemic. And I'm curious to hear your perspective, given that you study and are an expert on innovation in the Jewish world. What would you like to see happen in the next few months or years to build on the evolution that we're seeing? And maybe to rewind just a step, what other kinds of innovation are you seeing in the Jewish community during this time? I was talking with my colleagues, um, my fellow faculty members for this course with Klal uh, leading through innovation and, um, and also even with the students in, in class over this time. So it's an online course anyway, and it's given me a real chance to, um, to have a place to think about what's going on immediately right now during coronavirus, during the pandemic. And one thing I realized, um, is that all of a sudden the whole Jewish world are innovators because otherwise they have nothing. All the options for doing it the way we've always done it are cut off. So I'm really interested in what's being created right now because there's always been a Jewish you know, innovation sphere, whether you called it that or not, right? But the last decade or two, uh, whether it's Indie Minyanim or rabbi-led emergent communities or um, using technology in certain ways or, you know, all of these different pieces, you know, Jewish spirituality. and But legacy institutions haven't necessarily incorporated those or even necessarily valued innovation um, as, as something they do. So, um, you know, many of us have heard, you know, if, if we're rabbis or young rabbis, especially coming into a new job or a new community, and we're brim full of ideas from rabbinical school, and someone somewhere is bound to tell us, well, we've never done it that way. So why, why would you need that? Why would you need to have a young adult Hanukkah party at a gay bar in Montreal? Why would you need to, right? There's sort of, um, it's hard to change. And the thing is, in the last seven, eight weeks, even the most staid, um, you know, stuffy legacy institution has had to ask itself, what do we mean now? How do we adapt to this moment? Which really is the question of innovation, is the question of, of you know, how to remain relevant. Um, but this has been the most incredible seven or eight week like design sprint ever. <laughs> um, this has been a time where everybody has had to scramble and try new things and just chuck the rule book out the window. I am wondering if that will mean more openness to innovative strategies in the years ahead. I'm wondering if that will shake up some of our larger institutions, some of our legacy institutions to say, oh, like we know what it's like not to do it the way we've always done it. And maybe we should keep trying some new things. I think also um, the idea of asking what do our people need? Because in the first weeks, everyone was rushing to live stream their services because if you're a synagogue, I mean, not everyone, all, you know, synagogues were rushing to figure out could they live stream services because they thought of themselves as services providers, right? Prayer service providers. 
Um, I think that this time has probably revealed to a lot of synagogue communities whether they have robust communal connections or not. Because if the main thing you do is host prayer services and you don't also have the chesed committee or you don't also have people knowing each other deeply, you don't also have a culture of community connection, then when you eliminate prayer services, you kind of eliminate your whole purpose for being. But in Jewish tradition, a synagogue isn't just for prayer. It's your community. And I think that it has probably been a wake-up call to a variety of different synagogue communities of like, if we don't have services, what are we left with? Some synagogues may be delighted to say, oh, wow, our chesed committee has, you know, our, 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 um, our support committee has really stepped up and is figuring out grocery runs for our elders and, right? Or you may find wow, I'm not, you know, our, that committee really kind of disbanded a couple years ago. There wasn't a lot of interest in it. Um, so I think it's been a wake up call, I'm sure in a lot of ways. And I am hopeful as we look forward that this, this, um, this design sprint will continue to inspire all kinds of Jewish institutions to ask who are we serving and what do they really, really need from us? I think you summed that up so perfectly. I'm curious, are you currently teaching that Leadership Through Innovation course for the rabbinical students? Yeah, our last class is tomorrow, actually. And has this situation affected your curriculum? Yes, uh, intensely. So the curriculum was covering... Um, you know, the same kind of thing you would learn in a social entrepreneurship workshop, but in addition, um, a perspective on the sociology of uh, changing religious community affiliation in North America today, as well as, you know, personal work around my own story and how how that connects to change, right? So a bunch of different modules um, in this class. And the pandemic struck about halfway through the semester. And I'm really just, uh, I have so much admiration um, for Rabbi Elon Babchuk and, um, and the other staff. Um, Rabbi Babchuk uh, created this course uh, through Klal. He's the director of innovation there. Um, that we, we really changed the course. Um, we, we cut some pieces. It seemed a little technical for, for this moment. And also the students were going to be creating and prototyping Jewish community projects. And we said, okay, we want to be sure everyone knows that your project might be explicitly about coronavirus and how to help, you know, if you're working for a synagogue, you're working for a community organization, how to actually manage the next number of weeks. So a lot of people have switched their projects to address this moment and to do a kind of rapid prototype around um, different things coming up because of coronavirus. Um, But also, frankly, just as an educator, we had to really um, we, we, we spend more time in class checking in on people and seeing how everyone's doing. And um, we're a lot kinder, I'll say, with the grading schedule for sure. Um, but I think, I think that we've spent a lot of time in class talking about what we're seeing um, in the Jewish community as a response to the pandemic and analyzing it from the tools that we're, we've been building in the class. So I'm about to wrap up our conversation, but Rabbi Julia, I just wanted to ask if there's anything else about your work or about the Jewish community that's on your mind that you want to get out before we finish up. I think I think just I'm still hopeful, um, as I said before, that the experience of needing to really change how Jewish community is happening when your go-to functions are cut off. Um, I am really hopeful that, that that will shake up the community in really positive ways. And um, I think there's a lot of possibility now. There's a lot of, um, yeah, there's a lot of possibility open now that wasn't before because, you know, a board would be looking at the bottom line in a certain way, would be looking at stability and preserving the institution. 
Um, and these last number of weeks, the boards, let's say, you know, of, of institutions have had to preserve them by rapidly changing. And that kind of meeting the moment um, hasn't as much been part of what change adverse, you know, um, boards have been doing. And so I think, you know, anybody coming out of this, this pandemic, I hope, will have a sense of the good that, that bringing change can do, um, that it can really bring in whole new ways of relating. I mean, even just the idea that I'm, I'm actually feel closer to the people in a minion I go to um, now than I did before because of our WhatsApp chat. You know, the messages mm -hmm. that were going across it right before Passover, especially my husband wrote in and said, what has just made you totally lose it? And people were writing in hilarious things like my husband took a shower, you know, or like, <laughs> <laughs> like, like my partner finished cleaning the counters before I was done cleaning the fridge, right? Like there's just um, that there are possible ways of connecting that might not have seemed ideal before, but are now part of our toolbox. Um, and I, I am really hopeful about that and about the ways in which that also can allow for accessibility and inclusion, the ways in which that can allow for spiritual closeness. Um, I think having more tools in our toolbox is, is always a good idea and can really help strengthen the Jewish community and strengthen our, our connection with each other. And what is the thing that you're most looking forward to doing once we're allowed to start returning to our normal lives? Mm. Oh, I'm flooded with all of these like sensory images. I, I think like having a Shabbat dinner with our friends and having their kids entertain my kids while we just have a really good cocktail and laugh. I just really miss, you know, being able to, uh, to share those moments and, um, and hugging my people and seeing my parents, my parents are in Boston, and I'm in Toronto. And I, I was supposed we were supposed to go there for Passover, we were supposed to go there at the end of June, uh, you know, being with my family. Um, we, I, I haven't seen them for a long time. So those are those are the things I'm looking forward to the most. Rabbi Julia, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and your optimism for the direction of the Jewish community, um, both as a whole and in response to this very unusual and difficult time that we're living through right now. And um, I had an awesome time getting to speak with you today. So thank you. Me too. Thank you so much. Leader Folk is all about elevating voices and starting conversations, so now we'd love to hear from you. Email us at podcast at tcjewfolk.com to share your thoughts, your ideas, or to nominate future guests. Leader Folk is a project of Jew Folk Inc. and the Jew Folk Podcast Network. For more information, visit tcjewfolk.com slash podcast. <laughs>